Hello and welcome. We appreciate you joining us today. We wanted to give you an update on where we are with reopening high schools five days a week. I first want to start with thanking um, our administrators at the high school level who have been working hand in hand with us here at central office trying to figure out how we could safely return to school. Um, I think that most of you all have seen the plan by now, and this is an opportunity for you to hear some more information and maybe have some clarifying questions answered for you. So I'm going to do a very brief overview, and I think everyone knows by now that I'm Dr. Temu Lucero, your superintendent of schools, and I'm going to jump right in and just go over a few highlights with you, and then we're going to move on to our principals who are going to take you through a little bit of overview of more specific information and then it'll be your turn to either ask some questions or to get some clarifying questions answered. So I do want to just remind everyone that we have worked very closely with our local health departments make and medical advisor to make this decision. Remember, it is not about just one number, but trends that we see over a, a certain period of time that they're looking for. And these are numbers that they look at daily and weekly. And so we're able to figure out what are those rates of positive COVID cases, the hospitalization of COVID cases and deaths from COVID-19. We also work very closely with the Department of Health at the state level. And the Department of Health has been looking very carefully at what does the in-school transmission look like across the state. And what they found is the schools that have returned five days a week, they're still seeing very low, low rates of in-school transmission. We are really excited in Stanford that we do have access to testing, which is one of the ways that we can safely return to school. And so we have a in your student based health centers, which are at both of your comprehensive high schools and AITE has access through RIP. So there are an op, um, our staff and our students are able to get regular testing as needed. And there are many testing sites around the city of Stanford that Mayor Martin fought very hard to keep in place as we return to school. So that's another really important thing for us to realize. I do want to acknowledge the fact that our city did prioritize our teachers being vaccinated and our staff. So that was another way that they thought it was safe for us to return to school is to make sure that our teachers have received their vaccination, which they had the opportunity to have um, for the last few weeks. We have been looking at our ventilation systems and making sure that they are up to par. I know there are lots of questions in this area. So I have invited Kevin McCarthy to just talk for a couple of minutes because I want everyone to be clear that all the re requirements and recommendations that were made at the beginning of the school year through the State Department of Education that are the requirements for returning to school with a proper ventilation system were put in place. And so I'm going to turn it over to Kevin just for a couple of minutes to give me an update on that. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, just so we all understand, so in um, August of 2020, in accordance with DPH guidelines, we hired a third party engineering contractor to assess and identify deficiencies within our existing ventilation systems. We assessed and identified deficiencies in all the ventilation systems, rooftop units, air handlers, bathroom exhaust fans, unit ventilators, any existing mechanical system that provides airflow into our buildings were looked at. Um, Commissioning basically means assessment and identifying deficiencies, which is the requirement uh, per, the D, per DPH. Uh, after we identified the deficiencies, we prioritized them and repaired or scheduled to be repaired the items that needed to be, be conducted. Additionally, in our existing systems, we reprogrammed the systems to start and provide ventilation two hours before the first custodian comes in the building and 
continually supply the ventilation until one hour after the last custodian leaves the building in accordance with DPH requirements. And then finally, um, just so you're aware, we have multiple people watching our systems from facilities department and the managers and directors level to the custodians, to building principals, as well as our in-house mechanics and our outside vendors. Um, and then finally, with regards to HVAC filters, the recommendation from the, from the CDC is to use the highest rating filter that our equipment will accept. And that is how we are operating all of our buildings in Stanford. Thank you, Kevin. I really appreciate that. Um, Kevin is available to staff that have questions. And so if there are questions that come up, he is always willing to come over to the building and walk you through any concerns that you still may have. I also want to speak about the idea of live streaming. There's been lots of questions about the requirements for live streaming. And it is, and we have spoken to our union about this, that it is mandatory that our teachers live stream for any students who choose the remote hybrid learning model. So if students are coming to school five days a week, they will be in their class. But if they decide that they would like the remote learning option for the hybrid model, that it will be live streamed by our teachers and our union is aware of this. I also want to talk, oh, also um, for the live streaming, those students who are quarantined will also be permitted to um, participate in the live streaming for um, any students who are quarantined. There are many questions about quarantining, whether or not we are gonna change from the 14 day to the 10 day. We are working with our health professionals to determine whether or not that is appropriate. And so please stay tuned. We don't wanna to change too many things at one time. So we are at 14 days right now for quarantining, but this is something we will revisit after spring break. So I think those are the top things that I wanted to share with you. And I don't wanna take up too much time, but again, I just want to sincerely thank our administrators who have worked really hard to help us get to this moment today. So at this point, I will turn it over to them. I'm actually gonna jump in real quick, Dr. Lucero. Good evening, okay. everyone. Michael Fernandez, I'm Associate Superintendent. I'll be serving as the moderator this evening. Um, just wanna go over, go over the rest of this evening's presentation and listening session. We do have a, a few more slides, a short presentation that our high school principals will, will be doing. And then we'll, we'll dedicate the majority of the time to listening to you and answering uh, any of the questions that you might have. And if you do have a question, you can use the, the Q&A feature in uh, this webinar. Uh, you simply type the question and hit return. We do ask, we do ask that you indicate the school um, that your child attends. Um, we, we also have staff that will be answering questions, uh, typing answers to questions in, in the question and answer in addition to answering questions out loud. So it is important that you indicate the school that your child attends prior to writing your question. And I'll try to remind you of that later in the session. We are doing this session again in Spanish starting at 6.30. We have until uh, around 6.25. Uh, this evening for this session and the session will also be recorded um, so that you can see it or others can see it at a later time and we will also be responding to any questions that we don't get to this evening e each of the high schools has set up an email which i'll share with you at the end of the presentation that you can also submit questions to uh, if we're not able to get to your questions this evening so uh, at this time, I just wanna again, acknowledge our principals, uh, thank them, and I'm gonna turn it over uh, to Ms. Tina Rivera, who's gonna be talking about the plan. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tina Rivera, I'm the proud principal of AITE, and I'm sharing with you the plan. So beginning on April 16th, which is the Friday that we return from the spring recess, this will be a remote learning day for all students and this will allow our high school staff an opportunity to prepare for the transition. This transition, we will be transitioning to this plan beginning on Monday, April 19th, for all of those students who are currently enrolled in the hybrid model. And this is the five-day in-person uh, learning. 
all three high schools will have a full day schedule. I know that um, many of the parents that I've spoken to, you've heard different things, you've heard we may have an early release, but the final plan right now is that all high schools will have a full day schedule. Uh, desks will be minimum at three feet apart, and that's per the CDC recommendation. Obviously, our goal in uh, more case in most cases is to have six feet apart where that's possible, but there will be no desk um, that's less than three feet apart. Students will still be able to request barriers or additional PPE. So we have face masks and other PPE that students, um, some have requests already since the beginning of the school year, and they will be uh, able to continue to request that uh, when they return um, to full five-day in-person learning. Also, um, we are going to try to utilize additional identified spaces for lunch where possible. And again, the goal is always six feet of social distancing where uh, it's possible and we will not have anything less than uh, three feet apart. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. I'm now gonna turn it over to Mr. Ray Maker from Stanford High School to talk about schedules. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight, Stanford. Um, we do wanna take a few minutes to chat a little bit about some of the differences or changes that we're gonna be seeing as we go through this uh, alterations adjustment. So first and foremost, the anchor program uh, is gonna be using their regular schedule as will AITE. So it means that AITE will be going to their AB um, schedule period. Uh, and, and West Hill Stanford High School will be having uh, mirror images of the schedules. Now, currently um, we, we do have similar schedules, but because of that fourth lunch wave, we do have to have some alterations. So um, one of the things that's going to stay the same is that we are still going to have seven total class periods, periods one through seven. Um, they're static, there's not going to be any rotation. Um, we're going to have periods one through four and six and seven that will now be 43 minutes long each with a five minute passing time, which remains, this, remains the same. Um, the period that's going to be slightly different is, is period five. Now, period five is um, going to house our fourth lunch wave, typically has three. Um, so that will give us 112 minutes, a long block, which will include 43 minutes of instructional time, 25 minute lunch wave, 35 minutes of a supervised study period and nine minutes worth of transitional period in and out from uh, class to lunch and then back ultimately to their class. Thanks, Mr. Maka. I'm now gonna turn it over to Mr. Rinaldi, who's gonna be talking about the survey. There's a little bit of a delay on the PowerPoint transition of the slides, so just give me a second. All right. Hey, thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Good evening, everyone. I'm Mike Rinaldi, principal of West Hill High School. So parents are going to have uh, two choices in this survey for their children. Choice number one, the 100% in-person choice for those folks who are choosing to have their children attend school every day. The student must participate in person at their high school every day. Only excused absences will be accepted for the, when they need to perhaps uh, learn remotely if they happen to be ill or can't get to school on that particular day. Choice number two is 100% remote. So students uh, in the 100% remote option will participate remotely every day. Only excused absences will be accepted for non-participation and those students will receive, will receive their instruction via live streaming lessons from their teacher's classroom. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Rinaldi. And we do encourage you to, to fill out that survey if you haven't, it's very important information that we want to uh, obtain as we move forward. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Green to talk about uh, survey participation. Good evening, everyone. The survey um, is to be completed, just one survey per student. We're asking that they be completed by 11.59 p.m. this Wednesday, March 31st. And the decision to return to five-day in-person learning, as Dr. Lucero has said, will be based 
on current data. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Green. Uh, we have some exciting news uh, to share with you. This is uh, hot off the press breaking news. And I'm gonna be asking, I think she's on Amy Taylor. Um, Amy is the vice president of the Community Health Center Western Region. who will be sharing this important news with us, Amy. Hi everyone, good evening. Thank you for that introduction. Yes, I am Amy Taylor and I'm the regional vice president for the Community Health Center Inks. And um, Stanford is one of the cities that I have the privilege of working in. Um, as many of you might know, we have our mass vaccination location at the old Lord and Taylor store on High Ridge and Long Ridge roads. Um, and uh, when we became aware that the state was going to open up the vaccines to people 16 and up, we uh, knew that we wanted to um, reserve some of those appointments for some really important people in our community, which are our um, high school students. Um, and we're focusing first on high school seniors because we know that um, the timing is really important. All of these rites of passage and special celebrations that the seniors get to participate in, we wanted to try to help make that possible for them. And at the same time, making it a safer environment for all students and teachers return to return back to school. We know that the teachers have the opportunity to, to be vaccinated um, and now getting eligible students vaccinated is, is really important. And so what we've done is um, we've blocked our schedules at our mass vaccination location at Lord and Taylor the weekend of the 17th and 18th for all Stanford public school students. Um, we have a, a simple registration process uh, that the uh, principals of the school and the health department have been working with us to coordinate. And basically what it will be is you will receive an email with a registration link. We ask that um, you attest that the person who is getting registered is a, a senior at one of the Stanford public schools. Um, and then it will ask for the student's age. If the student is 16 or 17, then the parent must complete a consent process. If the student is 18 or older, the student is the one who uh, will consent when they come to the vaccination location. After that, the student or the parent, depending upon the age of the student, will complete a registration process, which gathers all of the appropriate demographic information that we will need to provide that vaccine to the student. Um, after that, the student or parent will select the time and day that the student would like to be vaccinated. And uh, they will then get a confirmation email confirming the time and day of that vaccination. It is really important that people understand that if a student is 16 or 17, we cannot vaccinate them without parental consent. Also part of the vaccination process is something called the pre-vaccination questionnaire. And these are questions that we need to ask the student before we can vaccinate them. In the consent for the parent and also when for students 18 and older, we ask that families really look at these questions. They will come out with the registration form and talk to your student about how they will answer those questions when they come to get vaccinated. There are questions about allergies and reactions to certain products. And most students probably know their, their medical history, but we just want parents to be and, and um, caregivers to be very aware of these questions and take the time to go over them with their students so that they can answer uh, completely when they come to get vaccinated. And I think that's that's pretty much it. We're, we're really hoping, hoping that um, this weekend event of the April 17th and 18th provides students with an opportunity to get vaccinated. Um, we will be administering the Pfizer vaccine, which is, um, has, is safe and effective for uh, people 16 and up. And um, at this point, the clinic is just for seniors. 
regardless of their age, but we are, we are really trying to start with students who are just seniors so we can get them done first. Um, and then we will be looking to how do we vaccinate um, everybody who is 16 and above, regardless of what grade they are in. Um, we will then be uh, hosting a clinic for these students to get their second dose. The schedules will be blocked and um, that weekend as well. And um, students will simply return at the same time that they selected for the first dose. And we will, we will vaccinate them again um, three weeks after their first dose. So if anybody has any questions, I'm sure um, somebody will tell me how I can answer them. Thank you, Amy. And we'll be sure to um, pose those questions if they are asked about the vaccine clinic. So thank you very much for that. Okay, um, we're going to now get to your questions. I want to, we're seeing a lot of questions in the question and answer feature. I'm seeing our team answering. We've answered 30 of those questions already. We'll continue to, to answer and ask questions. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, Dr. Lucero, I think this one might be for you, but someone asked about um, low transmission rates uh, that are that are happening in the schools, but is wondering about the the increased number of of students having to quarantine. Would you yeah. mind just speaking to that a bit? I appreciate them bringing this up. Um, yeah, we have to make really hard choices when we're deciding whether or not we're going to return to school five days a week. And then just talking to other school districts who have done this, and we've even noticed it with our elementary and middle school students, is that because we were six feet apart the number of students we had to quarantine on a regular basis was relatively low. Unfortunately, with returning to school and we're not going to be six feet apart, we still will need to um, quarantine our students that are within six feet, at, especially at the high school level and middle school level. Elementary, we're doing something slightly different, but because this is geared towards our high school students, I'm gonna talk about the fact that we are doing an airplane manifesto model, which allows for us to determine what, what students set within six feet for more than 15 minutes and those would be the students who would be required to quarantine. There is a question um, that we were asked earlier today of whether or not um, once they're vaccinated, fully vaccinated, would they be able to not quarantine? And the answer is yes, but it's two weeks after your last shot. Thank you, Dr. Lucero. There are, there's a couple questions um, that are asking um, about the vaccine and if their child can start on remote and then after they're vaccinated come into school. So I don't know if one of the principals or someone wants to take that question. It's about flexibility with the models essentially. Mike, could you repeat that? I was just typing an answer I can help out if you can repeat the question. Um, a couple parents had asked um, if their child could start in remote um, on the 19th, knowing that their child would get vaccinated. And by the time the um, vaccine period went by, that can they can they rejoin in person? There's a few questions about that. Got it. <laughs> so as I understand it, um, you know, that survey has the two different varieties of the question. Um, in, in regards to, um, you know, are you going to come back full in person or are you going to come back 100% in remote? Um, that remote means that you keep your hybrid schedule and you'll be relying on um, teachers giving the uh, live streaming from their classrooms to your, your family, your students, your children at home. Um, I do know that that question was asked earlier today and I believe that, you know, the, the, there are seats for all the blue and the green students um, but we don't want to have this, this, this experience of I'm in one day, I'm out one day, I'm in another day, I'm not there for a week. Uh, it creates greater uh, um, you know, inconsistency in regards of the experience of face-to-face. Of -face. So um, I certainly do understand that the vaccination is important for many of us, all of us. And um, you know, that's something that probably would have to be um, you know, looked at more deeply in regards to how we can make that happen. Long and short of it is there is blue and green seats for everybody. Um, 
you know, and if you started remote and wanted to come back, uh, that's that's something you'd have to decide for an entire department, the entire district. Yeah, Mr. Mank, I just wanted to elaborate on that. I think um, this survey data is going to be really important to help the high school principals finalize the plans for uh, preparing for the return of um, which, you know, the number of students that um, are going to come back. So, for example, you know, if I have 500 students at AITE right now in the hybrid model and 300 decide to come back, I can base my uh, lunch numbers and other things on that number. Um, you know, I think that, um, I don't know if we said it, but, you know, certainly there's a disclaimer to this in that, um, you know, anything is subject to change based on the current, most current data. And somebody in the chat said, you know, what happens if all of a sudden we have an uptick in the, the number of cases? Well, you know, as Dr. Lucero said at the beginning of this presentation, she's been making decisions all along with guidance from the Stanford Health Department, the uh, DPH, and other medical officials. So if that was the case, then obviously we would transition to remote or have another plan. So I think that, you know, um, what Mr. Manka said and what we're saying right now is that, you know, um, things are possible, um, but really in order for us to prepare for the 19th, we're trying to get, um, you know, your response right now um, to one of those two options that you're presented with. And Amy, can you jump in here? If our students get um, vaccinated on the 17th or 18th, I'm counting my weeks right now, it's gonna be close to the end of May or the first week in June, they would be fully vaccinated. Is that correct? Um, can you hear me? I can. Okay. So if they get vaccinated with their first dose on April 17th, their second dose will be on May 8th. And then two weeks after that is May 22nd. So Dr. Lucero, your, your, your math is, is spot on. Um, and likewise, if they get vaccinated on the 18th, their second dose will be on the 9th. And two weeks after that, when they're considered fully vaccinated would be the 23rd of May. So we will look into um, that question a little bit more, talk about it a little bit more as administrators and we'll get some more information out. Okay, um, I'll try to get some other questions here. There's one about the, um, I, a lot of people have asked about the online, uh, excuse me, the um, online option as opposed to the early release. And um, I know I've answered that a lot of times with um, parents and students. And I think that uh, one of the things, uh, a big considerations um, was the lunch wave. So, you know, students have to eat and um, sending kids home with a grab and go no matter what time of the day meant that uh, any student who was riding the bus would be removing their masks to eat their food. And that means that they would be on that bus for longer than 15 minutes without a mask. So now we're looking at quarantining entire buses and we didn't want to put anybody at risk. So that was one of the primary uh, reasons where we made that uh, shift. And um, again, like everything that we've done since the hybrid model, since the reopening really has been done with um, your children's health and safety as our number one priority. Thanks, Tina. Um, I have a couple of questions from West Hill High School parents. Uh, one is if a child has a barrier, does that prevent him or her from having to quarantine if the student next to them tested positive? That's a very good question. I saw it earlier, didn't answer yet because I wasn't sure of the answer. I don't know what uh, yeah. I mean that, that would have Oh, sorry, Dr. Sorry, I could probably answer it, Mr. Yeah. Rinaldi. Um, so the answer is yes, um, regardless of if you have on a mask, no mask, if you're within six feet of someone for more than 15 minutes, whether you have a barrier or a mask on, um, you would need to quarantine. Thank you, Dr. Lucero. And the other West Hill High School question has to do with ventilation. Uh, they wanted some clarification um, asking that um, the recent update that Kevin just gave this evening, does that mean that the ventilation system at West Hill High School is now running well and at, at capacity and that, that students would be safe? That's all that question. I'll be happy to answer it. So the ventilation system is operating as, as well as it can be. Um, when I say there is still some deficiencies left, you know, when, when we look at commissioning a building, they 
they look at everything and anything and put that as a deficiency. So a couple of deficiencies on West Hills list are um, related to discharge temperature. So we don't see on the computer how we run our programs through the automation. When the air comes into the building, we don't see the temperature that it comes into the building or the temperature that it leaves the air handler before it enters the ductwork to come into the classroom it has nothing to do with ventilation. You know, the air is still being supplied to the space. It's just, we can't tell what, what temperature the air is at. So we, we do, and, and West Hill people know, um, there is some temperature issues at the building, but that is separate from ventilation. Ventilation is just the airflow into the room. And then there's a second component of heating and ventilation, which is the heating part, which is actually tempering the air so that you're comfortable as an occupant in the space. Thank you, Kevin. Um, this is a Stanford High parent. I think any of our our high school principals or Dr. Cyril can answer this. What, what's our main goal that we're trying to accomplish by having students come in five days a week for the last two months of the school year? I can start and um, I know you gave that to others, but um, you know, young, young people, um, our students, your children, my freshmen, um, there's lots of behaviors um, and those behaviors could be disconnectedness, disengagement, social, emotional health and wellness, um, safety, food, getting back into a routine and a pattern so that we can become part of the, the, the teaching and learning community with greater regularity. Um, if, if we can do this and do this with safety and do it well, I think it's, 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 it's of great importance for our learners across our school district to be able to do this. Um, obviously doing it in elementary and middle school, um, if we can do this with safety in mind, uh, I think that this is the right step um, to be able to have our kids beginning to get back onto the track um, of, of uh, success for the future. Thanks, Ray. I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in on that. I would, I, I agree with Mr. Manka for sure, uh, for not maybe for all students, but for many students being in the building and, and seeing their teachers and their classmates every day is something that they've missed and, and it's been a, a burden for them emotionally for many months now. And so for many uh, that will uh, be an improvement, right? Um, so for all those reasons, I, I, it is, it will be a good thing for those kids for sure. Yeah, and, and just to echo that sentiment of um, Mr. Manka and Mr. Rinaldi, um, we have a uh, little, little longer than eight weeks left in the, um, in the last marking period, which begins on April 19th. And, um, you know, there, there's still time for, for teachers to have in-person interventions for students who have been struggling, whether it's academ academically or social emotionally. Um, this is a nice transition too to do it now um, because obviously the goal has always been to return um, more students and, and eventually all of our students back to school. So this is a nice transition now, um, you know, because the longer that some of these students remain out, we've heard from many parents and we've heard from many teachers that um, students are struggling the most on their remote days. So getting them back, hopefully um, they're able to get that either social, emotional or academic support uh, that they need to be successful. And I can tell you um, firsthand, Anchors has the privilege of having middle school students and they are back. And just seeing them every day in the building as compared to on the screen, there is a very big difference with their connectedness being back in the routine and they are improving academically and social emotionally every day. So um, I think that that wall contributes to why we are doing this. I, I wanna just respond to one question. I answered it a lot today. Um, I was in the uh, lunch waves and in the classrooms and students had many, many questions. Teachers had been talking about um, the plan and they've been asking questions even before that. And the question is, have you pulled the students to see how many wanna go back full-time versus how many wanna remain hybrid? It sounds like 
parents are putting pressure on. I know that Dr. Lucero met with several students and that their feelings, at least the students that she met with, they have a lot of concerns. And one of the um, one of their concerns was why are we messing with something that's working right now or they feel is working, right? They don't know maybe the whole scope of everything. Um, and so, you know, kids did ask me that same question when I went into classrooms and during lunch today. And I said, you know, and I made the announcement at lunchtime. So everybody who was here today on Green Day heard that your parents are going to receive a survey and you need to go home and have a discussion with your parents. I said, because ultimately um, it's a family decision. And, you know, there are some students who, you know, are very responsible and can handle remote learning. And, you know, they may be compromised or have a family member that's compromised and this works for them. But there may be other students who say that they can handle remote learning, but we see from, you know, the data from report cards and other things that they're really not handling it in the way that obviously their parents or school staff um, would like them to be able to handle it. So, you know, um, ultimately you are um, responsible, for, responsible for your children. And I said, you know, you guys are minors. So I said, you need to really go home and talk with your family, but ultimately it's your parents' decision. So, um, you know, I mean, this is no different than other decisions that we may agree or disagree with our children, but, um, that's, that's where it is. The survey was sent to you as parents, and you have to make that decision what you feel is best for your child. Amy, we have a few questions about the vaccine. I know you answered some of these. One is, um, can it be for juniors? I know you said no to that. Another question was, um, a few parents have asked, do they have to accompany their child to the vaccine clinic um, if, that's, if that's required? If you can answer that. I'd be happy to. And at this point, we're prioritizing the seniors. Um, we do intend to open this up to 16 and 17 year old uh, sophomores and juniors as well. Um, but at this point, the first wave, we really want to make sure that those seniors um, get vaccinated first so that they can perhaps participate in a graduation or do other senior rites of passages. Um, and um, we will absolutely get everybody in the community vaccinated. Um, the other question related to whether parents need to accompany their 16 and 17 year old to the mass vaccination site, as seniors know, they do not have to. As long as they complete that consent form and they've um, read all of the elements in the consent and they've had conversations with their children about how to complete the pre-vaccination questionnaire, they do not. We will not vaccinate anyone who does not have that parental consent if they are not 18 and up, though. So it's really important that if a child who is 16 or 17 comes to get vaccinated, one, that their parents have completed that consent, and two, that they've registered. If somebody shows up and they have not registered in advance, we will not vaccinate them. Um, because one, we need that parental consent, and two, we also need for even 18 year olds to have the opportunity um, to have conversations with their families about uh, their medical history. Um, but it is not required for parents to come to the vaccination event. They're welcome to, of course. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Michael, uh, I do wanna jump in here just a bit. We have been um, speaking with um, Stanford Hospital and the state about um, the age eligibility, knowing that we really appreciate that CHC is prioritizing our seniors. However, all 16 um, students who are 16 or um, up are age eligible starting on April 1st. So you are able to get on and secure your own appointment. So I really do encourage people to um, get, go to the site. It's um, You can go to the front of the city's website and it will take you directly to the information you need to know. It's also um, available in many different locations, but, and we'll actually, um, in my communication, we'll make sure that we put the information in there, but it's really important to know that you are age eligible beginning on April the 1st. So you do not have to wait for Stanford Public Schools to um, provide you with an opportunity to get vaccinated. Thanks, Dr. Lucero. I see a few questions around live streaming. 
So I'd ask the principals to answer this. What Maybe you could just speak a little bit to live streaming. Uh, one parent asked, would they keep the same teachers if they, they switched to um, full remote? And another just asked, is it required for teachers? Because they felt some teachers were not live streaming at Stanford High and Westville High School. If some of you could speak to that. I'll start by saying that the teachers wouldn't be the same teachers that they have now. DTLA is a separate uh, program and will remain um, as it is for the remainder of the school year. So if you choose full remote learning, the teacher you will have is a teacher you currently have. And that's my answer with regard to that. Anyone else? There's a, yeah, also, it's, it's Ray, I'm sorry, right. I just ahead, something I couldn't find the mic. Um, yeah, so, and specifically for, for Stanford High School uh, families, there is a link on our front splash screen, uh, stanfordhigh.org. If you have issues when it comes to live streaming with your child's teachers, um, please click on that. It's a Google Doc and it brings you through a step-by-step -step process on, on who to contact, who to call, who to email. Uh, an order operations, if you will, um, so that we can try to get things corrected. Uh, I certainly know that sometimes there's different situations that might result on something changing on, on a given day. Um, sometimes um, there, there are, are reasons or rationale for why it might not, why it might not happen, but if it's happening regularly, uh, then that's something certainly we'd want to know. Um, this plan would result, or, or pardon me, would require uh, live streaming be a big part of this. So, um, Folks from, from Stanford High follow that link. I gave it to the one parent that had asked, um, but stanfordhigh.org, and it says questions with DL. Check it out. I see a few questions around the use of barriers. Um, some parents have said that the uh, some of the middle schools, and elementary schools, have had barriers installed in all classrooms. What is the plan for barriers in high school, and should we consider uh, having barriers on all desks in high school classrooms? So when we went to um, school at the elementary and middle school to return to school, um, CDC had not put out their recommendations. To, as you know, it went from six to three feet for social distancing. And so because of that, our local health department worked with us with the plan for whether or not students would need to have a barrier on their desk. And so if you are eating within a classroom, which is the case at a lot of our elementary schools, you need to be three feet apart with a barrier. But the majority of our middle schools, and um, it is not required at the middle school level because they're eating at a separate location. Some principals with an overabundance of caution have decided that they were gonna put up the barriers. But again, that was before they went from a six feet to a three feet. Um, recommendation by the CDC. And so um, the requirement is if you are three feet apart and you have on your mask, you do not need a barrier. Barriers will meet, be made available to students if they would like one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lucero. <laughs> um, just lost my train of thought. There's some questions about a few parents are asking, uh, will their child be able to attend uh, graduation and end of year events if they do not get the vaccine? And I don't know if that's something we've discussed, but I don't know if anybody wants to answer that. We have not had that conversation with our local health department. Um, so please stay tuned with that. I don't see us um, excluding um, students from these activities because whatever we put in place, people will need to be um, social distance. Um, there will be reasons why someone cannot be vaccinated for a medical reason or a personal reason that um, involves um, some medical history. And because of that, we don't wanna exclude students. So we will be working with our local health department to develop plans for our end of the year activities that will be safe for all students. Right, and, ju and just to repeat again and be clear, we're, we're not requiring that seniors will not be able to attend if they don't get their vaccine. So that will not be the case. Just want to be clear because I see a lot of questions about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add, so um, as Dr. Lucero was saying, um, the high schools 
I've been already meeting with um, Amy Baldotti and other um, staff and their, our prom plans will be vetted by the um, health department. Um, we wanna keep everyone safe because we know that if students get quarantined late in the year, it could mean that they're not able to participate in other um, end of the year ceremony. So it's really, like I said, always been um, our primary goal to keep everyone, um, you know, safe and uh, healthy. So we're going to continue to make sure that we do that at any event. There's a number of questions about um, lunch and having lunch outside um, as a way to, to be yeah. safe for I for students taking off their mask? Um, and what, are we doing any outside time for students? I know at AITE, we're not able to do lunch outside because we just don't have the adult supervision. And we've also found that when students are outside on their own, that they're not always in compliance with the board policy, which is mask in the building and on school grounds. But as soon as students are finished with their lunch, um, we're gonna allow them to go out for mask breaks and to go outside in the good weather. We just don't have the supervision or you know um, area for them to be seated and, and have lunch outside. But as soon as they're done, and they've been able to do this, and many have in the better weather, they'll be able to go outside. Stanford High, uh, we we do have um, you know our this this extra lunch area that we are able to uh, create for the extra seats that we need. It's actually in our auxiliary gym. So it's, it's air conditioned. Uh, that's that's one perk. Um, we are we are also getting uh, 100 outdoor table rentals and seat rentals. Um, they'll be in the new courtyard and they will be uh, placed in areas along the decking and also along the grassy area. They'll be used when the weather permits. Um, but again, as as Ms. Rivera mentions, um, supervision uh, students can't be unsupervised obviously to be compliant with the mask, um, but also just, you know, during, during uh, if they're in a room or if they're in an area. So we just have to work to make sure that we've got the proper adults, either security staff or administrators um, being able to, to, to watch those areas. So we're working on, on getting some folks outside. There's, um, there's a couple, I know there's a couple questions answered, but there's questions around AP exams uh, for students who opt for remote learning. I don't know if Ms. Baldotti or one of the principals want to answer that question. I'll answer for, for West Hill. We're, we're actually meeting and hopefully finalizing our plans for AP tomorrow. So there will be a communication going out from West Hill either right before April break or as upon our return. So just stay tuned for that. We are planning and ready to communicate soon. Yeah, I think um, this is Amy Beldotti. I think all the, the schools are planning. We worked uh, with the schools at the district level. We actually chose the first administration window that AP offered um, so that we have opportunities for makeups. If students are quarantining during the first two weeks of May, we will have time almost through mid-June for students to make those exams up. So um, it's our intention to get as many as we can in the first two weeks of May, but certainly we'll be working with students and families uh, for students who may be quarantining during those two weeks. Thank you. Dr. Lucero, there's a few questions around how, do, how are we making decisions to come back to either hybrid or full remote um, there's questions around what happens if we see if we have to quarantine large numbers. And I know you spoke to this at the beginning, maybe this person got here later, a few of these people did. Um, how do we know when it's time to go back to hybrid or full remote? So weekly, there's information put out um, that, and we look at the trends of the number of positive cases in Sanford, in Fairfield County, and across the state of Connecticut. Um, how many hospitalizations we see and um, deaths due to COVID. So we will continue to look in those areas, um, partnering with our medical advisor, Dr. Yoon and Dr. Calder, our, um, who's the head of the Department of Health. All of these conversations are being um, had 
every few days to get a sense of where we are with our numbers. And if we see an uptick, we will, um, and there's a trend in that number, we will uh, make a decision of whether or not, and they will make a, a recommendation of returning to the hybrid model or returning to full distance teaching and learning. And this has been the same process we've used the entire school year. Thank you, Dr. Pocero. Um, principals, there's some questions about arrival and dismissal, pick up and drop off. Uh, there's an assumption, obviously, that there might be more parents, more, more congestion because more parents dropping kids off. Do we have any plans for that? Sure. Um, I can speak as an, I'm sure the other principals have done. Uh, we have met with our members of our school safety team. We have met um, with Oh, Joe, Joe Kennedy, my apologies, Joe. <laughs> and uh, we're also meeting with Captain Sue Brethauer shortly. Um, we've met uh, and, and discussed plans for an anticipated uptick in drop-offs and pickup from parents. Um, you know, we've, we've got three or four primary um, routes that are being debated for pros and cons right now. We haven't hashed anything out. Um, we're gonna be reliant on our SRO. Um, we are going to be reliant on probably some new signage, some appointment of some key security staff, um, looking to probably either request or split our crossing guards from the front and also have something down in the rear of the building. Uh, there's a lot of moving pieces. So um, we've, we've got multiple considerations. Nothing's ironed out. As soon as we've got that approved from the police, we'll have that communicated to our, our teachers, our students, and our staff, uh, our families. Okay, um, I'd say we have about four minutes left. I'm trying to get to some different questions. Um, um, if anyone sees a good question, please. I'm having a hard time here. You want help um, with a question, Mike? You see, you see a good one. Feel free to announce so it there, and answer it. Yeah, there, there was a question regarding um, what a, what our decision might be with students whose parents either don't get the opportunity or don't or can't uh, fill out the survey. How, how is that going to be determined? Yeah, and uh, the, I, default, the default the, I thought was for the um, a full in person return if they didn't. So we want to make sure that we're encouraging our families to uh, make their choice because I think there was something in the um, chat that said, you know, we've already made our decision, which we haven't. In fact, you have the decision before you. It's one or the other. You don't, it's not going to be an either or for the district. You, you have to um, determine how comfortable you feel with sending your child um, back to the five-day in-person learning. So um, we want to hear from everybody. Um, that's the goal. Um, we don't want to go to the default, which is if we don't hear from you, we'll assume that you're coming. We, we want to hear from you. And if it's a technical reason why you can't fill out the survey, please call the school. We can help you with that and do it for you. I'm seeing more questions about live streaming. I'm just going to answer this. We, teachers will be expected to live stream every day. If you choose five days remote, that means your child, every class your child is in, they will be able to hear and see what is happening for the most part. Um, so it is every day live streaming that we're expecting for students that choose the remote option. Um, there's a question about what else is considered an excused absence for what for Stanford High School. Um, I don't know if Mr. Manko wants to speak to that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I saw that one before. I'm not really sure what that one means. My recommendation would be to call uh, our Dean of Students, Mr. Augusto. Mr. Augusto has uh, resources, websites, and links he can share with you. Uh, our process, it, you know, d again, it depends if you're a, a hybrid person and you're coming, you're supposed to be coming in on blue days and you don't show up and it's because of quarantine. Uh, there's a certain process that will take place for how that appeals, how your child goes through that process. If your child just has absences because of stomach ache and they're going to miss school days, uh, there's a QR code. It's all touchless. It is available. Uh, again, when your child returns back to school, they need to just take a picture with their um, with their their uh, 
cell phone camera and um, that will redirect them to a Google form where they fill out the information. You would upload uh, documents indicating why you would be absent. Um, yeah, so if you can contact Tom Augusto, it's T-A-G-O-S-T-O -O at stanfordct.gov or he is 977-5614. Or of course, shoot me an email, it's on the screen, I can get you that resource as well. So your, yeah, regarding uh, attendance for West Hill, it's our Dean of Students as well. His name is Juan Pazmino. So it's J-P-A-Z-I-M-O at stanfordct.gov. Uh, and I, I see a question, Mike, regarding parent uh, drop off and pick up at West Hill. Can I just respond to it? Please, please. So, so it's always a bit of an issue here at West Hill. We have no other real options. What we're going to try to do is, is have admin uh, and security uh, more present in those areas to just try to get through it. But it's it's definitely going to be, as it has been at the middle school level and elementary school level, it's going to be more crowded and it's going to take a little time to get everybody through, but we're going to do our best to supervise all of that and make sure it's safe. So our time has uh, come to an end. Unfortunately, we have another session starting in, in about three minutes. Um, before I turn it over to Dr. Lucero to close, I just want to remind you that you can email uh, your schools directly with additional questions. We will be answering the remaining questions that were answered um, in the question and answer feature. And we do thank you for taking the time. Dr. Lucero. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank all the panelists for helping to answer the questions today and all the families who joined us. Just remember that health and safety will always be at the forefront of our decision making. We will be looking at the trends of our data over the next few weeks. And if we have any concerns, we will work with our health department and our medical advisors to make an addition, a, a different educational model recommendation. But at this point, we believe that it is safe to return our students to school five days a week. And so we look forward to you filling out your survey, getting that information back to us so that we can all transition into spring break and use that information to prepare for students to return on the 19th um, to five days a week. Thank you so much for taking your time to join us today and have a wonderful end of your evening.